Hello, my dears. Did you know that a new edition of the Diagnostic Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, also known as my absolute worst foe, was published in March of 2022? And I meant to make a video about it in March of this year, but then that didn't happen. So now we're doing it now in the middle of July? Me neither. I also didn't know that. Anyway, today is going to be part one of three into a little, I say little, it's not little, into a deep dive series uh, about where the DSM came from, the intersection between disability and capitalism, and a breaking down of various diagnoses through a different lens in an attempt to answer the question of, is neurotypicality real? The videos can be watched in absolutely any order and still totally make complete sense. Um, they build on each other kind of sideways, if that makes sense. Everything is very intertwined, so there's no specific order when it comes to talking about this stuff. But either way, I'm really excited to have you join me as we tear apart the very foundations of our existence. Um, it's going to be great. If you're interested in this kind of deep dive, I have a playlist that you can find in the card above over here. It is called Psst, Your Psych and Bio Profs Lied to You, where you will find lots more popular science debunked in a needlessly thorough way. And with that, let us get started. Also, audio description for friends who may need it. I am a white person in my early 20s. I always say my early 20s. I am 20. I'm a white person who is 20. I have brownish, blondish, curly hair. I am currently wearing a dress that you can't see, but it has purple straps. And I am sitting in front of a bookshelf that has books on it, and there are photos behind me on the wall. So there you go. As a blueprint for this video specifically, we're going to talk about how we decide what is categorized as abnormal, how we diagnose and the issues with diagnoses, followed by the history of the uh, text itself, which is unsurprisingly a bit of a disaster, talk about the updates that we see in the new March 2022 DSM, and then a couple of thoughts about all of that. The initial plan for this video was to make a sort of book review, but it's the DSM kind of humor thing that you learn things from, but it was baseline funny. But then the more I researched for it, the more I realized that that idea was not going to work because it's not really funny. But now you get to ponder what that might have looked like. Or maybe I'll make a reel. I might make a reel. We'll see. Now the first question for today is how do we define abnormal or atypical or disorder or any other bad word you may want to use. Generally I try really hard not to use the word normal in my vocabulary in general, but also when talking about psych and disability stuff. It is probably going to come up a lot more frequently in these videos. Yeah. Anyway, according to my abnormal psychology professor who gave us some readings I was able to dig up in order to research for this video, there are four things that categorize a behavior as a disorder that requires diagnosis. And it's usually framed as the four Ds. Distress, deviance, dysfunction, and dangerousness. Distress refers to psychological distress that is affecting social, emotional, or physical functioning. Deviance is either statistical deviance, meaning infrequent in the population, and or deviance from social norms, meaning acceptance within that population. Dysfunction means that the person is unable to fulfill their various roles, such as family, work, school, life, etc., and that very well may be context specific. And lastly, dangerousness, which is not at all necessary for diagnosis, but it is definitely something to keep in mind um, that the person is a danger to themselves or others and or engaging in potentially dangerous behavior. Now, when it comes to the causes of mental disorders, there are and have been many different models as to what is responsible for mental disorders. My personal favorite being the wind has bad vibes from the early 1600s. But the one most commonly in practice today is called the multipath model, which states that mental disorders are caused by multiple factors intertwined with each other at different amounts, these factors being biological, psychological, social, and sociocultural. So all of that seems fairly straightforward. I mean, if somebody ticks all four of those boxes, they must have a mental disorder, then they can get labeled, then they can get treatment and go on their merry way with a regular life, right? Well, if you're watching this video, you and I both know that that is not how mental disorders work. Because mental disorders are obviously a lot harder to categorize in comparison to, I don't know, a broken leg or a blood disorder. In order for a psychologist to... Psycholo psychologist, why did I shorten that? In order for a psychologist to say this behavior or outlook or thought pattern is a mental symptom, that psychologist has to render a judgment on said behavior or outlook or thought pattern, etc. And if super obvious objective things, such as a clear list of symptoms for a chronic illness, for example, are debated upon and misdiagnosed daily in the physical medical field, what makes you think that a psychologist who has to listen to a, what a person says analyze what they say through a lens of their own personal biases through the social and ethical context of our society, and then come out with a symptom list in order to give a diagnosis, is going to be very accurate. Because like, by definition of society, it's just not going to be. It's not 
a, you have a disorder or you don't. That's not how that works. And that's also why self-diagnosis, where people compare their own personal thought patterns to those listed in the manual without the third party involved and their biases interfering with that, is actually probably a lot more accurate and a lot better for you. But I digress. That's not what we're talking about today. Now, some major issues with diagnosis, just kind of in general, is that it discounts gradations between experiences. It's more of a, you either have this or you don't have this kind of thing, which means that we can't catch these negative behaviors earlier before they become mental disorders because they're not categorized as such then. Also, there is so much overlap between diagnoses. Things cause each other, things that would potentially change a diagnosis or are unknown to or indistinguishable to a professional are hard to tell. And also, obviously different professionals have different specialties and focuses and will therefore have different opinions on what disorder a person may have. For example, I went to an anxiety specialist when I was little, was diagnosed with anxiety and OCD, and then later in life I went to an autism specialist and she said that I was actually just autistic. And then another one that I went to who was a migraine specialist said I just had anxiety. Also, it discounts all the gradations in day-to-day -day life. For example, I only have depressive episodes when I'm in a long-term situation where I'm denied basic accommodations or human rights. That makes sense. And some autistic people who are diagnosed as a level one, which is the equivalent of high functioning, it's because they have a college degree and because they're comfortable with public speaking, even though they're also unable to tie their own shoelaces or remember that they need to eat sometimes. That's not a me example. I do remember to eat occasionally and I also can tie shoes, so. There's that. But in general, humans are not meant to fit into strict categories, so there's always going to be outliers no matter what you do and how well you try to categorize things. It's also very common for people to assume that one diagnosis is equivalent to one type of lived experience. That's just not the case, and it encourages the idea that our emotional and mental distress is caused by a biological defect. It's our own problem, it's our own deficit or disease. When the field of mental health was just beginning, it became widely agreed upon throughout physicians and whatnot, that all problems in living are due to physico-chemical processes, despite them really having no evidence of any neurological differences or defects. They just kind of started writing the DSM with this theory in mind when they had absolutely no proof of it. They were like, the science is going to come later. And in fact, it's it's been common belief on some level, either consciously or not, that mental illness is the cause of human disharmony. Humans don't get along because of the outliers, and that means the outliers must have something wrong with them and that needs to be fixed. And this leads people to think that good mental health will lead to a good life rather than the other way around, which is usually how it works. Also, it's a lot easier to swallow humanity's moral conflicts if it's the fault of mental illness and not just, you know, humans doing bad things because humans do bad things. A lot of what I've been saying is from a 1960 paper by Thomas Saz, I hope I pronounced your name right, sir, um, called The Myth of Mental Illness, which is a little like everybody thinks they're a special snowflake and nobody really is, which I didn't quite care for that tone, but otherwise it is a really great article and you should definitely give it a read. I will link it in the description. Also, the fact that this idea that we consider novel and radical today was openly published and widely shared in 1960 is very baffling to me. But anyway, one other point that he made is that when diagnosing, a psychologist cites deviations in the non-medical, such as social, emotional, ethical, etc. parts of life, establishes this diagnosis on non-medical grounds, and then expects those things to be fixed medically, despite not being medical to begin with. Which, if you really think about that at all, that makes no sense. Also, it's super important to recognize that this obsession with diagnoses and labeling things is very dominant in Western colonial and imperialist culture. The binaries of normal and abnormal, of healthy and sick, don't exist in many cultures that actually consider many complexities of the human condition that go beyond traditional Western medical ideas and ideals. So if all of this is true and has been at least vaguely accepted since 1960, why do we continue diagnosing? Well, effectively, it's for three reasons. First, money. This is not surprising. Psychologists get paid by insurance companies and insurance companies won't pay psychologists if there is not a quote reason to treat. And their reason to treat is a diagnosis. So basically, if a psychologist wants to be paid for giving you therapy, they need to have a diagnosis that they code into your chart so they get paid. Second, legal stuff. The DSM is used to determine what is insanity by the court system as well as for prisons, schools, social service agencies, and governments. And third, treatment. Diagnoses allow access to certain services and accommodations. So basically, if we were to say, I don't know, want to eliminate diagnosis as a thing, insurance companies could pay psychologists regardless because everybody needs help, kind of in the way they pay doctors for your yearly physical where you don't need a diagnosis other than it's just your yearly physical. And also we can just make accommodations open to everyone. You don't need a diagnosis to get into them. Or just make accessibility universal and then we wouldn't need accommodations altogether. 
Just a thought. And I don't know enough about law stuff in order to debunk point number two. But if you do, feel free to drop it in the comments for me. But back to the diagnostic process here. Where the heck did the DSM come from in the first place? We're gonna go all the way back to 1860 when Florence Nightingale, who is not a very nice person as, as far as I've heard, um, she proposed to the, International to the International Statistical Congress that maybe they should make some sort of formal list of all the diagnoses that people know about so that it's therefore easier for doctors to study them and diagnose and treat them and such. And it kind of became a sort of aggregation of hospital data that was all over the place. Then in 1893, a French doctor named Jacques Bertillon wrote the Bertillon classification of causes of death, um, which he gave to the Statistical Congress and it became used pretty widely in medical settings. In 1898, the committee people decided maybe we should update it every 10 years because people die for lots of different reasons and we learn things about science. So they didn't update in 1900 and then every 10 years subsequently. The sixth edition was a big revision where they split it into two volumes and uh, included not just the cause of death, but also the cause of illnesses and whatnot for when you're not dead. Um, as well as mental disorders. And so that's when they changed the name to the International Statistical Classification of Diseases, Injuries, and Causes of Death, which was shortened to the ICD. This was the ICD-6, and it was published in 1949. The ICD is maintained by the World Health Organization. We are on the 10th one at this point, and that's part of the United Nations, if you were wondering. I always thought the ICD was British, and I was wrong, so... Now we know things. But anyway, the ICD-6 in 1949 kind of inspired, for lack of a better word, the publication of the first DSM in 1952. And I don't know what possessed the American Psychiatric Association to decide to create their own version of a thing that already existed, but that's American culture for you. Um, and also I would assume that it's something to do with the fact that the ICD kind of just lists all the things and Americans wanted to make it just mental illnesses. Um, but I genuinely have no idea. So if you know that answer, please let me know. But either way, that's the story of the first DSM Kind of, because we forgot to talk about the why. Why did we start categorizing mental disorders in 1949? What was the demand that that was meeting? Well, basically there were a handful of diagnoses in the categories of like idiocy and insanity and feeble-mindedness and whatnot since the late 1800s. And when the APA was created in 1921, they made a sort of classification system. This was then formalized a bit more by the US Army and was used in World War II for figuring out who was mentally cool to enlist into the army and go to war. And that system seemed to work until they realized that the rejection rates for psychiatric reasons were drastically different between states and also even be di between different enlistment centers in the same states. And that made them go, hmm, maybe our criteria is not standardized or specific and we should do something about it. So that's where the 1952 DSM came from. The thing is though, even though they were like, this is reliable and you should use it for diagnostics. It was widely seen by psychologists as completely unreliable and therefore the text was mostly ignored by everybody who wasn't in the US Army. And the uh, DSM-2, which came out in 1968, would also pretty much be ignored. Um, by the way, if you're interested in historical DSMs, you can find them all as free PDFs on the internet. I don't know why you would be interested in that, but maybe you are. But you see, in 1966, a dude by the name of Robert Spitzer became part of the task force that was in charge of writing and collating the DSM. He began as a note taker for the committee, but he was super dedicated and worked really, 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 really hard. And he was eventually promoted and became the chair of the task force for the DSM-3 in the early 1970s. And because he had the ultimate administrative control over this whole thing, he decided, you know what? The DSM's getting a makeover. It was just too unreliable and he was gonna do something about it, dang it. So he is the guy who's behind the symptom checklists that we see for every disorder in the DSM today. His goal was to reduce interpretive var variance by standardizing the definitions and descriptions to describe behaviors that are visible to the human eye. The thing was, at the time, the research that he wanted to have in order to properly organize the DSM was just not there. So instead, he got creative, he found all of the experts in various fields of psychology related to different disorders, had meetings with all of them where they all just kind of existed and talked to each other, furiously typed out everything that was said, and tried to make sense of it after the fact in order to put it into his DSM. I read an article about him, I'll link it in the description, but basically he was known around the department as super antisocial and focused almost exclusively on work. He was almost obsessed with the disorders and overly fascinated with new ones. Also his marriage fell apart because of how hard he worked on the book and also the fact that he cheated on his wife with somebody else who was working on the book. But it was a direct result of the DSM. So we're gonna say it's the DSM's fault. So if you've ever had relationships ruined because of a DSM diagnosis, know that it ruined the relationships with the guy who wrote it too. You're welcome. But also he married his mistress, so maybe he's happy. But anyway, that's beside the point. What I'm trying to say is that he had a mission and he was going to do it and nobody was going to stop him, which 
meant that he often did things without asking others. Um, like a lot of a lot of his DSM was his DSM because he just went and wrote it. And when asked for his criteria for choosing to add a disease or illness or not, he said his criteria was, and I quote, if it's logical. And sometimes he would hear of an instance of a weird case, he would bring in the people working on that potential case, talk to them, and then on the spot create a new disorder for that case and add it to his book. And if you're wondering, this is how we got factitious disorder, which we talked about in our video last week, a couple days ago? Something like that. Anyway, his brandy new revised DSM was published in 1980. Since then we've had the DSM 3R in 1987, the DSM 4 in 1994, the DSM 5 in 2013, and then the DSM text revision or TR in March of 2022. Today it is over 900 pages, it defines close to 300 mental illnesses, and it's about $85 for, per book, but also there's free PDFs online. But anyway, since Spitzer's 1980 DSM, psychologists and lay people alike figured that this book is now 100% reliable, we fixed the problem, and this is the psychology bible, and it has no flaws or wrongdoings. We'll talk about that in a second. Spitzer himself is also often described as a hero who fixed all of the reliability issues and saved modern medicine. And um, yeah, so first of all, uh, Spitzer tried to make PMS a disorder, as in like menstrual mood swings. He also tried to create a personality disorder that implied that abused wives were responsible for uh, their abuse. So yeah. And while he did remove homosexuality from the DSM in 19... 74. He just replaced it with a new diagnostic code for individuals distressed by their homosexuality and that existed under a different name until the DSM in 2013. So basically he changed it to not be homosexuality to make queer rights groups happy, but he didn't actually change anything. He left it in there. Also, he was no longer chair of the committee by the time the DSM-4 came around. It was instead chaired by a guy named Dr. Alan Francis, a guy who wrote a really long and kind of very horrifying article about how he's kept dissociative identity disorder in the DSM because people won't let him take it out, but he is firmly convinced that people who have it are just faking it for attention. So I'm not sure how much of an improvement having him instead was. But also, while Spitzer did in theory make the reliability problem better in the sense that he more specifically laid out diagnostic criteria, when it comes to diagnostics for treatment research purposes in situations where they have time and resources for extensive interviews, which if you're wondering, those extensive interviews as somebody who was in a psychology study, it's a really traumatizing process and I don't recommend, um, the book is fairly reliable. However, no study has been able to show any reliability improvements in the places where diagnostics actually happen most frequently, i.e. the office of a general therapist therapist or psychologist. In fact, some studies show that reliability today might actually be worse than it was in the 1950s. Um, and to quote one of the texts that I forgot which one it is, I, I didn't write it down where I got the quote from, but I have a quote, both psychiatry and the public have benefited it in a less tangible way from the collective fantasy that the DSM was a genuine scientific tool. So what have they updated in the recent one? What's new? What's changed? First of all, according to the task force, Cultural, racial, and ethnic factors, as well as gender inclusivity, have been intentionally reviewed and updated. For example, in the criteria for gender dysphoria, they changed outdated words to more positive things like assigned gender at birth and experienced gender, rather than gender they want to be. They also added some diagnoses such as stimulant-induced mild neurocognitive disorder, which recognizes the fact that neurocognitive symptoms, such as difficulties with learning and memory and executive functioning and whatnot, can be associated with potential stimulant use. Um, this was added to the category of other substance-induced mild neurocognitive disorders that already existed. There's an alcohol one, there's one for inhalants, and there's one for sedative hy hy hypnotic or anxiolytic substances. Yeah. Another diagnosis is prolonged grief disorder, which basically means that if you're unable to move on with your life after a year or six months for a child, um, after the death of somebody or some other big traumatic sad event, you have this disorder and apparently one in 10 adults have prolonged grief disorder. They also added unspecified mood disorder, which basically is a placeholder disorder of sorts for psychologists when they're not quite sure if it's depression or manic depression or bipolar or what is going on there. Um, I would assume this exists just for coding for insurance purposes. I really hope. And then we have the most infuriating piece, which is that they've changed the autism criteria because one of the chairs of the committee is convinced that autism is overdiagnosed and becoming too common. And so therefore we need to make the criteria stricter in order to take down case numbers which really does sound a lot like the argument of, well, if we just stop testing for COVID, we won't have any COVID cases, especially because autism 
It's widely known that the reason that there's been a recent boom in autism diagnoses is because A, the pandemic has put people in burnout, but B, because autistic people who are not cis white boy who like train are getting diagnosed now, like people of color and people of marginalized genders, and also you couldn't get a simultaneous diagnosis of autism and ADHD until 2013, and because ADHD is seen as having less stigma, even though it has just as much stigma, it's just different, most doctors chose to just diagnose with ADHD. There's an interview with the chair. Uh, it's a free podcast. It's infuriating beyond belief. It's 45 minutes long. I'll link it in the description for you if you want to check it out. But basically they're tightening the criteria so that you need to meet more of the criteria and the criteria itself is a little bit more specific. And this is supposed to make it so that the people who really need the support for their autism are getting the support. Which is absurd because that was also the argument for adding functioning labels um, and trying to keep them. Um, and it still meant that nobody got support and uh, no one gets supports, and people just don't want to be held responsible for larger numbers of people floundering in today's society um, with a label of autism. But anyway, that's a discussion for the next video. In this series, we're going to talk about how disability only exists for capitalist purposes. Because, yeah. And as frustrating and terrible and also kind of scary these changes are, I'm actually quite hopeful that the this will spark some sort of widespread conversation um, that it has been doing that will remind people of how much of a trash fire the DSM actually is and how inaccessible the world is and try to maybe help all of us become a little bit more critical of the fact that diagnosis and disability is a social construct that is meant to keep people in their places. The fact that people are noticing and getting angry about all of this gives me hope. This feels kind of like how they kept trying to pathologize transness and queerness and because they were working so so hard at getting their criteria correct it completely blew up in their face and we ended up just creating massive communities completely outside of medical terms. Dysphoria still exists but you you know what I mean. We've made a, a very large pro like a lot of improvements since then and I'm ever hopeful that we can reach that kind of liberation with mental illness and neurodivergency in the near future as well. But either way, even if you don't fit into the formal diagnostic criteria, the only purpose on a human to human level of these labels is so that you can understand your strengths and your weaknesses better, figure out what your needs are and explain them to other people. And as much as I hate the DSM and I really really want it set on fire and chucked out of the nearest window, I think it does on some level have a wee bit of power in that because there is definitely the threat of how it divides up our community into tinier or smaller subsections and makes it harder to fight systems of oppression. Um, and this conversation has been happening in the queer community as well about all of the, you know, the prevalence and additions of a gazillion different flags and microsexualities and whatnot and how maybe we should just all unite under overarching queerness. But I think that there's actually a lot of value in understanding your experience in the closest to you possible way because there's so much intersectionality and non-monolithic experience in massive communities like ours. Kind of in the same way that many other disability groups kind of have their own disability specific communities. We have the autistic community and then we have the wider disability community, for example. And I think it's easy to look at the DSM and at the systems that harm us and say that they're terrible and we need to overhaul the whole thing and get rid of it. And while I love that energy and it's really great, it's really awesome, it's not the most practical of things. And people keep saying that we need to just pick a side. Whether we want to keep psychiatric diagnosis or choose to have completely neutral to diversity that needs universal acceptance. And I don't think we should pick a side, honestly, because while many mental illnesses get infinitely, infinitely, infinitely better when a person is in a fully accessible and safe environment, no matter what we do to try to make the whole world accessible, there's no such thing as a completely accessible environment. And imagining that is entirely unattainable. And also there's always still going to be people who feel like their mental illnesses are hindering them and that they are suffering and that they do want help. And I think that we should have help, just help that is open and free and accessible to all kinds of people who potentially need it without the need of a diagnosis. And I don't know if there's really a way to have the two systems properly coexist. I think the medical system as a whole right now is full of a lot of really stubborn people who don't like to have their beliefs challenged. Sorry, let me rephrase that. I don't think that. I very much know that the medical system as a whole is full of a lot of really stubborn people who don't like to have their beliefs challenged. Um, I have hopes for the next generation of doctors and psychiatrists and whatnot. Um, I do think that the education system is letting those people down a little bit, but I'm hopeful that we're going to have some better physicians and more better physicians than we currently do who are able to teach everybody more once they're already in the field um, and that those people will inevitably also become professors which will reteach things in an accessible manner for the uh, people going into those professions in the future. Like I so understand the desire to take the system that has hurt us over and over and over and over again and just set it on fire but I don't think that we're gonna make things fully accessible that way either no matter how much we want to believe that we can. So 
Anyway, I hope that you learned something today. I sure as heck did. The next video is going to be expanding on this topic into the realm of disability as a capitalist construct. Um, so feel free to subscribe so that you know when it comes out. And also let me know what you think about all of this. I would absolutely love to hear all of your input, though also please remember to keep it kind. And yeah, as always, thank you for listening. Thank you for learning. Remember, it's never too late to start over. And I look forward to seeing you, my dear, in the next one.